So today our video is going to be about human wildlife conflict with respect to carnivores like leopards, tigers and other animals. And to tell us about the wildlife conflict in India, we have Dr. Mayuk Chatterjee who has experience in working in this area of inclusive conservation for more than 10 years with Wildlife Trust of India. Now he has moved to UK and he is associated with Chester Zoo and he is in Chester. Welcome Dr. Mayuk and over thank to you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Susan. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. So, yeah, so I've been uh, working in the field of human wildlife conflict mitigation for quite a few years now, um, trying to develop projects on the ground, um, you know, in order to sort of uh, imp you know, have long-term impacts on the ground to mitigate conflicts uh, and, uh, you know, bring, bring some kind of resolution to what's going on uh, in certain places in India. So my focus largely has been India. Now I've uh, also begun expanding to other joining countries such as Nepal, uh, Bangladesh, uh, some parts of Central Asia as well. Yeah, I think wildlife has no borders. So yeah. we can't limit it to India and show the problems are there all over. True. Yeah. But of course, our audience is basically from India. So maybe we should talk more about India, the problems right. in India. Of course, of course. Yeah. So uh, would you be asking certain questions and then uh, how, how do we take it ahead? Um, well, the format which we decided you can just talk, I guess. Okay, um, sure. So just just to give a, I mean, to begin with, I think uh, for our audience, uh, just to talk about what human wildlife conflict is in general, because I mean, it's it's become a fairly fancy term now. Uh, you know, everybody's hearing about this everywhere, about human wildlife conflict. Uh, so essentially what it basically means is it's, it's a conflict between humans and uh, individual, individual animals or groups of animals uh, you know, of wildlife species. Uh, so for example, it could be a conflict between a group of humans and a single elephant or a herd of elephants. Um, and it's largely uh, a human perspective because uh, the situation is where a group or a collective group of human beings don't want a particular species uh, to be prevalent around them, uh, primarily because it, it entails certain costs that they're not willing to bear anymore. Um, and uh, conflict, can have multiple levels. Um, so it could begin with certain number of incidents, certain frequency of incidents that keep occurring. Um, and then if those incidents are not manageable, whether, whether it's by people or whether it's by external agencies, it the conflict grows deeper and deeper. Um, so there are studies now, extensive case studies from across the world that, be, that have been collated and people are talking about this, that once you go very deep into the conflict situation and it becomes a sort of an identity conflict, it becomes very hard to really address. Um, so what I mean by that is when incidents start occurring where, you know, certain wild animals cause negative impacts and which lead, you know, leads to losses. So for example, I might lose some crop or I might lose some livestock uh, to a particular wild animal or a group of animals. Uh, but when that is unmanageable and over a long period of time, there will be a growing resentment in my mind for that uh, species, right? And all those who are there to conserve that species as well. So that becomes like a deep-rooted conflict. And further on, what happens is, uh, I will start getting so resentful that I will not be accepting of any kind of intervention that somebody, anybody tries to propose. Um, so the idea is that, you know, we try to prevent conflicts from going down to those deep levels, really. Um, now, beyond uh, just the levels of conflict, you know, the overall conflicts can be of varied types, um, as varied as if, you know, as many species there are really that get into conflict with human beings. Uh, so it can range from damage to crops, livestock, normal property. It can also be general competition uh, over natural resources. 
Um, so, for example, there have been studies done in, um, you know, the Himalayas where um, certain uh, groups of people who have livestock that are grazed uh, on certain pastures on which even wild herbivores depend. So that competition for the common grazing pasture itself has led to conflict. Um, so, you know, there are different forms of conflict like this. Um, you know, there's and at the extreme end, there's also loss of human lives um, and injuries, uh, which are caused by a number of large mammals in India. Um, and of course, uh, different species cause different kinds of impacts and species range from, um, you know, smaller animals like civets or snakes to very large uh, land dwelling mammals like rhinos or even uh, you know, semi-aquatic species like, for example, amphibious species like crocs. Uh, now, with respect to India, uh, why it is so special is that, uh, you know, why this whole thing about human wildlife conflicts is very special. Uh, India has some of the, you know, hottest of hotspots of human wildlife conflict with respect to many species. Uh, but despite that, and despite the constraint of space that we have, because we are a large population, uh, and it's not just India; it's also the neighboring countries of Nepal, uh, Bangladesh. So, all you know, these three, four countries in Southeast Asia, we're very unique in in, in a sense, because uh, despite the constraint of space, because of an overbearing uh, human population, uh, which again has led to you know high levels of conflict, we still are a can you know a group of countries who have a very preservationist approach. Uh, we still, uh, you know, people of these countries still, despite the, you know, high levels of conflict in some places, they do not, uh, they've not gone completely agonistic or apathic towards wildlife. Uh, they still want wildlife and they still have uh, the whole live and let live uh, in their ethos, in their culture really. Uh, and therefore it's very, uh, it, 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 these, these countries present a very, uh, star very, very stark examples of coexistence rather than human wildlife conflict the way I see it. People who've been working in this field have been also seeing is that uh, this, the sense of coexistence is gradually eroding uh, in a number of places. Uh, and although most people still would not readily shoot an elephant or tiger or any animal that they would see in their backyard in India or Nepal or you know, the neighboring country. Um, this this is gradually eroding and uh, we are seeing the tide still against wildlife species in some places. And these particular signs are worrying uh, because it's telling us that the existing tolerance that's prevalent in this entire landscape, uh, which is extremely unique, is, is disappearing very fast. And therefore, a lot of attention needs to be paid um, in order to, you know, sustain that um, over time, yeah. Um, now, one thing to understand that in India is, uh, yes, yeah, Susan, just as I'm continuing rambling, I think please interrupt me if you have any questions and uh, yeah. we can have it in a more interactive way if you like, yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah so, it, yeah, please. Then. Conflict in India, especially with leopards and tigers are on the rise, that's what, I'm yes. hearing from reports. Yes. Especially in areas like Sundarban, Uttarakhand, these these two places come to mind when you think of leopards and tigers, especially. True, true. That's very true. Uh, well, uh, if if you look at if you look at Sundarban, so thank you, you raised Sundarban. It's a very unique landscape. Uh, it's one of the largest. Uh, mangrove tiger habitats. It's the only mangrove tiger habitat in the world and one of the largest intact tiger habitats in the world. Um, and it's very interesting because uh, it's one of the hottest hotspots of human tiger conflict uh, in the world. But having looked at our data, we, so we collected uh, data from Sundarbans uh, during one of the project periods when, you know, while I was at Wildlife Trust of India. And what our data shows is that uh, I mean, you know, you, you see these ups and downs of numbers of people getting killed by tigers, uh, but it's largely consistent. So if you look at it statistically, it's largely consistent. Uh, so often what we see in terms of numbers as increase, the not necessarily there is an increase really. Uh, but what is increasing, which I would agree with you, is uh, what I already talked about, 
a growing resentment. So there are situations where a conflict has been persistent over time and has not been managed or not has, has not been addressed proactively. In those regions, the resentment is growing and therefore you see uh, the fallout of that resentment where, you know, in the, there are increasing levels of, um, you know, retaliatory killings of uh, animals. Uh, so in many parts of India, you know, we are witnessing uh, tigers getting snared, uh, you know, the use of jaw traps, uh, there's a poisoning, there's electrocution. It's the same with elephants as well. Uh, in many places, people are taking more and more aggressive measures to deal with individual situations. So, so these, these are the signs of erosion of the tolerance that in, in India, Nepal, and all these South Asian sister countries were a hallmark of. Um, and that, I think, is very, very worrying. Uh, because when, when that tolerance erodes away, you get what, what you see today in many other parts of the world. For example, uh, you know, many European countries, uh, people don't want a single wolf within even a thousand square kilometers. Uh, it's that level of intolerance that, that's already grown. And now in a place like India, it's just the tolerance that's allowed the wildlife to thrive. And if that goes away... Um, uh, you know, you wouldn't have, a, you you would basically see a downfall of a lot of uh, populations of wildlife species. And therefore, human wildlife conflict management and mitigation takes prime importance in a, in countries like India or Nepal or Bangladesh. Um, because if, if you do not manage it now, proactively, things will start going to, it, it's going to impact wildlife conservation uh, big time. Yeah. So, that inclusive conservation is so very important for us in India. Yes. In, inclusive, by inclusive, I mean involving the community. Yes. Yes. Around the national parks or in the villages around the national right. parks. Right. These are the people who are normally affected by the conflict. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that is how you managed the conflict in Manas Tiger Reserve. Yes, the yes. Conflict between rhinos and... Uh, uh, between people. elephants, elephants and people. Elephants and people, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. think that's a success story of Wildlife Trust of India. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, also, of course. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah. So yeah, very, very rightly said. That? Very rightly said, Susan. I mean, that is one of the uh, growing success stories. There are a couple of others as well. And... Uh, as you said, you know, one of the major issues uh, with respect to management of conflicts, especially with large mammals, um, and la which includes large carnivores, uh, is the lack of two things. One is education. The other is inclusivity. Um, now, the problem in, in countries like India, what has happened is the historical conservation approach itself has been very exclusionary. Uh, it has... Uh, time and again, and even now in many places, the, the approach is very, very top down. Uh, so it's, it excludes people or it will involve people in a very superficial way, um, uh, which is like, you know, okay, the world is telling me that I have to involve people. So, okay, so I have some meetings with people and do some bit of paperwork, but that's not what we're talking about. Uh, what we need is a very, very inclusive approach where the people, as you rightly said, are the ones who are facing the problem. Um, so if so, for example, if I if I give you an analogy, uh, if you have a drain leak in your house, and I just barge in and I shove you aside and I say, okay, this is how I have to deal with. You are not going to like it. Or even if I solve the solution, I give you a solution to the drain leak, you're probably going to find faults with it, right? And so that's just human nature. So now the thing is, people who are facing the problem, if we do not include them right from the very beginning, where we start discussing the problem, start seeking solutions from them, the what do they think, how, how do they think this can be solved? Uh, what do they really want? What are their perceptions? So all of that needs to be, that gamut of stuff needs to be taken into account. Uh, and then solutions need to be co-developed and co-planned co and co-developed. And I would even go on to say co-implemented. And when you brought up the story of Manas, uh, that is what uh, Wildlife Trust of India and uh, Chester Zoo began doing, that when we started the work, the first step, the very first step of the work was to go around villages. We spent almost a year going around villages, talking to people, asking them 
what they would like to be done, why they think the solution they are thinking is right, why do they think that it is right, why do they think that it will work, uh, how do they think they're going to resolve a crisis with that solution. So suppose that solution is put into play and it doesn't, it, it falters somehow, what are they going to do? So that those kinds of discussions ensued for almost a year. And it's only after that, and it's not, it's also not just like uh, unaccounted talk. We also collected a lot of data from those discussions. Uh, we put that together. We figured out what people seem to be talking about then took it again, we took it back to the people and said, okay, this is what it seems. So this is a, so these are the solutions you seem to be talking about. And so now how do you want to start working on it? And even the process of implementation came from the people. Uh, so when it comes from the people, when it, instead of a top-down approach, it becomes a bottoms up approach. What happens is a very simple thing. It, it just ensures that people agree to it from their hearts. So there's a huge buy-in to the solution, right? And when you when you have local buy-in, what happens is when you walk away, it still continues. And the biggest example of that is during the COVID pandemic, when our teams had to be withdrawn from Manas, uh, you know, nobody was really there. Uh, and, you know, there was this huge long fence that people themselves have constructed, but we were still apprehensive. What if, you know, they fail in maintaining it? What if an elephant breaks it? Who's going to repair it? Will they be able to repair it? All of that. And all our fears were put aside when we started seeing that people are going on regular patrols, they are maintaining the fence, they are doing everything. And why was that happening? It's simply because all we did was we gave them the expertise and they implemented it, right? So they came up with a solution, we put our expertise and they implemented the solution ultimately and they upkeep everything. And so that really helps. And, the, and, and I think cases like this should be replicated everywhere. And it is being, it's not that Manas is the only story. There's some wonderful case study from Sanjay Gandhi National Park, um, you know, by Vidyatriya and her team. It's, it's a huge team. The forest departments played a role. Media people have played, played a huge role. So, you know, when concerted efforts are made by different stakeholders uh, and there is huge level of inclusivity, co-planning, co-development, you will see signs of success. Yes, Vidya Atre has been doing a lot of outreach yes, in absolutely. case of leopard conflict. Yes, absolutely. She's even made some videos in Marathi, some yeah. plays which yes. tell yes. the people how important the Correct. carnivores are Correct. for biodiversity. Correct. So the people are convinced and they, they cooperate with the Oh yes. oh yes. Oh yes. Yeah. I mean. In fact, in, in fact, that's what the other point was when I spoke about two issues. One was inclusivity. The other was education. Uh, you see, Susan, the problem is, in terms of education, you know, there are many indigenous communities who've lived for eons with uh, wildlife, and they've lived amidst nature, so they've accumulated a huge amount of traditional knowledge. They know how to deal with it. But unfortunately, a large section of the Indian society does not, right? So, for example, if you take Dudwa Pilibhit, where we are working with um, Wildlife Trust of India, a large section of that society are migrants post-independence. Yeah? So they do not have that accumulated traditional knowledge in their, in their culture, which tells them how to deal with tigers or leopards, right? Consequently, what do you see? You basically see them, um, you know, getting very alarmed, yeah, uh, not knowing how to behave uh, when they're going into a forest, how to avoid encounters. Uh, and you, en you end up seeing a lot of these aggressive uh, incidents where people end up hurting themselves and the animals. Sometimes the animals die, sometimes um, some people die, die in the skirmish as well. Uh, so that education is wherever it's lacking, it's very necessary for it to be imparted. Uh, and for people to be made to understand that why something is being conserved and even what I feel is even more than just the why, I think something that needs to be uh, imparted is, you know, what is their role in safeguarding that and what are the benefits that they reap? So, for example, if I, uh, you know, if you talk to any 
um, you know, community person who's living beside a nice lush green forest, uh, if you can make the person see the benefits the person is reaping at the end of the day from being beside a lush green forest, the person then, you know, you're helping the person outweigh the cost with the benefits. So that also is education. You know, when you, when you start talking to people about the benefits, they reap vis-a-vis -vis the costs, right? So it, it's like, you know, it's for example, you know, if you, if you take the analogy of roads, like we all have highways and roads and we've got speeding cars, people die, you do have accidents, but we still want roads, right? Why do we want roads? Because obviously the benefits will outweigh, out, they outweigh the costs, right? And so you can put certain processes in place to minimize accidents, to minimize car crashes and people dying and people getting injured, but you still want roads, right? That's why you would put those pros. It's, just, it's pretty much the same thing with conflict. So, you know, there, there, there are solutions. You can actually bring in uh, processes that can minimize uh, damages from conflict. Uh, and therefore, you know, you can continue to coexist. That's a far reaching solution, which you'll recommend. Yeah. Education is the key. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think most people don't really focus a lot on education because things like education uh, do not, it, it does not give you an immediate impact. So, you know, you can't do five programs and think that, okay, people will change right after that, right? They, all these are like processes, really. They take time. And it, the time it will take and the impact it will have, how soon the impact will uh, be seen, varies not just on how long you do the program it also depends on you know a variety of other factors you know what is the level of conflict that people are already experiencing so you know if you're if you're addressing a population that has gone into deep-rooted conflicts it may take years for you to even get anywhere to even start working with them right so so it's a host of factors really but yeah education is the key you think social media has a role to play in this? Oh, yes. Uh, in fact, um, you know, I was just uh, mulling over uh, this aspect just before our discussion. And, uh, I, I, you know, when we talk about education, what comes to most people's mind is, Achha, you know, let's have some program with kids in schools, which is great. I mean, which is absolutely should be done. Uh, but education is something much beyond that. Uh, so one has to understand education with respect to empowerment, uh, because we often just see as education as, you know, just drilling in knowledge. And of course, India is unfortunately the system of education that's prevalent in India, even the regular curriculum is very rote style learning system. Uh, and so that's not what's required, you know, what you require is, you know, you require engagement and learning through engagement, which can then empower, if, even if it is children, even if it is youth, whether it's adults, it can empower them to act, right? Uh, and that is what we should aim for. And for doing that, the avenues are varied. You can do it through schools, you can do it through media, whether it's social media, whether it's uh, people who write articles, journalists, uh, it can be television, it can be radio shows, it can be, so these are just avenues. But the focus has to be on engagement and empowerment, really. You have to empower the population to not just have the knowledge, but to utilize that knowledge to be able to act. Are you creating some social media uh, clips which can be of use to people? Uh, Oh, well, not not right I now. I find uh, on social media, people are generally interested in watching a tiger attack or an yeah. elephant yes. attack. You yes. know, they are more interested in the adventure part of it. Yes. And those are the kind of things which get seen so very often. Yeah. But nobody, uh, uh, if you start telling people how to avoid this, I don't know how many people will watch it. Yeah, see, that so, is an art. In fact, that... Getting people interested in these things. Yeah. No, you're right. You're right. You're absolutely right. In fact, um, 
in fact that you see uh, i mean how you really spin the story is uh, is an art and that art is mastered by a particular skill set really and that's why you've got different fields and when you know uh, during my time in india we worked with a lot of uh, friends who are who are journalists and we've often had these discussions that you know for example if you know forget about the people who are looking things looking at things in social media even conservation organizations uh, or you know individuals organizations who are interested in wildlife conservations it's very hard for them to spin stories uh, which don't have sensationalized stuff right so for example in in one of my projects i found it really hard to tell stories and make them very sensational uh, where actually the problem was solved without doing much so for instance if there is a tiger in a sugarcane field and it has killed say two people in an accidental encounter two people have died because they bumped into the tiger so it's high profile case now and so there are two ways to solve it one is of course you know you have these veterinarians going in with guns and darting them and putting it in tiger out which becomes very sensational in itself because it's akin to hunting a tiger right so it catches everybody's attention but then there's a simpler way that you just remove the crowd and the tiger is gone it just slinks away yeah because it was not uh, any ways a man eater it just you know happened to bump into people and then it just attacked in self defense so it just walks away and it will avoid people you know for whatever rest of his life now that's a very simpler it's a cheaper solution but then how do you sensationalize that when you write a story and you say oh you know all that we did was move people away and the tiger walked away now, that's not interesting to people right so that's been a big challenge for us uh, but i think that's why people who are skilled in writing who you know media persons who are killed in making that spin out of simple things uh you know and making it sensational need to join forces really uh so we need more media people joining in and saying okay i'm going to give this a shot i'm going to make you know work towards making these spins uh, and i think they can um they can do a great job really because i mean i've got friends in media who've done it um so there's a friend who who's written very positive stories uh you know in sanjay gandhi national park and you know made change so i think media people have big role to play in whether it's whether they're going through social media or it's print media or you know television or whatever yes i think we are nearing the end of our session sure. so thank you so much it was so very nice talking to you thank you I thank you susan for having me there is need for such conversations happening yes absolutely more often and i hope we can talk again maybe on some other subject sure on a later date absolutely, absolutely. So, i edit this video and send a copy to you sure I'll thank you so much on our channel and absolutely I hope, uh, without any spin i hope people will absolutely See? let's hope so <laughs> okay thank you very much so this so any tiger killing a person or a leopard attack <laughs> yeah. but your talking should do the trick i think let's hope let's yeah. hope <laughs> let's yes. hope